How y'all doing? Shane asked me to speak a few weeks ago. My name is Phil Ramsey. Uh, got a lot of good members here of this church. Got saved here about 27 years ago, I believe. But I was thinking about some things I can talk about. And uh, I tell you, I love to hunt. If you're a hunter, raise your hand. Okay, cool. It's not a lot going on right now, hunting-wise. We got through with duck hunting. Uh, uh, coon hunting still going on? Yeah or nay? Just closed. Anyway, I like to do a little predator hunting. I was laying in the bed last night, actually, and I live in Garland, just right down the street, and I heard coyotes everywhere. So where we live, and really everywhere, there's coyotes everywhere, foxes, coyotes. So I like to do a predator hunting. Uh, not that I like to eat coyote. I think we got some coyote, right? No, we don't. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. There's no coyote. But uh, one thing you do when you coyote hunt or fox or predator hunting, uh, they're real smart. Their noses are very, very similar to deer. They have good, have a good nose. They got good eyes. So anytime I go uh, predator hunting, I always kind of get downwind where they can't win me. Uh, and I, I got a couple calls that I use. Like I said, I'm not a big time coyote hunter. A friend of mine, every so often, he'll let me borrow this electronic call, which is a good thing. You can actually get this away from you so many uh, feet and turn it on. Uh, they have a, a uh, sometimes I use a mouth call. Let me see. And it sounds like uh, a wounded rabbit. I'm probably not in good. That sucker's hurt. But coyotes like rabbits that are hurt. They really do. So if the coyotes are anywhere around, if the foxes are anywhere around, guess what? They're coming. They're coming. It's pretty neat. I like to uh, love a deer hunt, too. And it was, where's Aubrey the last one? Where are you at? Hey, come here. This is Aubrey V. V. Delashment. And what's the V for? Venison. Venison. Okay. So Aubrey, uh, Aubrey's a big time deer hunter. Me and Aubrey spend a lot of time in the woods. What would you do, Aubrey? Let's say it's it's in it's uh, the rut's going on. Deer are uh, in heat. You're in a stand. Not a lot happening. What would you do at that point? Go home. <laughs> Now, what would you do, really? No, I'd probably, uh, nothing happening, probably just start off with a few little grunts, you know, something light. And then I, depending on what time of the season it was, if it's pre-rut or something, I might kind of tickle some horns a little bit, just see if I could get something to show up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You got a grunt, you brought a grunt call. You got a little rack here. What would you do with that, my friend? You okay? <laughs> That's pretty good, Aubrey. I didn't. You sounded pretty good. Can't have one at eight. Can't have one. Hey, Aubrey's got a, a show on it. It's inside of Wildside. Comes on Tuesday nights on Dish and Direct. Christian outdoor show. Aubrey, appreciate that. Yes, sir. I've been with him a lot of times and seen him do that and film him and. Buck comes running up. It actually works. Not all the time. Sometimes you have to go home. Uh, turkey hunting. That's my favorite. Love to turkey hunt. Come here, Mickey. This is my good friend, Mickey Elder. Been turkey hunting with him a few times. 
Let's talk a minute. If you're turkey hunting, you know you got them roosted, right? Yes. You didn't you didn't scope them out. You got them roosted. Tell me what is the first thing you would probably do? Uh, first thing I do is I try to go in as quietly as possible. Make sure I don't make a lot of noise when I go in. And then my go-to call is to fly down cackle. So where they're, uh, if they're roosting, you're going to do a fly down. Well, how do, can you do that? Yes. Water right now. <laughs> Let's say he flew down, but Mr. Gobbler got about 15 ladies with him. And you know when he's got ladies with him, he don't want to leave the ladies. What would you do if he had 15 ladies with him? Well, that's when I try to call to the ladies. I you you don't call him, them. you call the ladies. That's right. I try to challenge them to come over because I know he's going to fall. What would you do? I cut it. You cut it. Cool, here they come. <laughs> Turkey sandwiches. Thank you, Mickey. Right, <laughs> duck hunt. How many duck hunters you got? Anybody duck hunt? No duck hunters? Two or three? What's up with that? Come here. Uh, I see Blake Shankle here. I spent some time with Blake hunting, filming him hunt. Uh, there's a duck call right there. Yep. Blake, if you're in the blind, and let's say some ducks are coming. Just give me a little scenario of my, what might would happen. Well, this year we didn't have to worry about too much. But if they do, if they are flying, you know, it just depends. Uh, normal situation, if I see ducks that are callable uh, and their, their wingtips are to me and their face is not at me, I'll hit them, you know, I'll hit them with a... a uh, a sequence of calls, and uh, and from there I'll work on uh, just watch their wingtips and see what they do. Whether they'll they'll bite on me, or if, you know if they'll they'll start sailing, or if they keep going. Uh, it just you know you always watch their wingtips and their actions. Well, go ahead and let loose one time. All right. Okay. Show so, me what so you. So if I if I uh, I'll run through a sequence of if I see one, he's starting to work, and then I'll work him down to the uh, water. <laughs> Uh, they're some great, great guys. But you know what? What do all of these calls have in common? What do all these calls have in common? I don't know. Let's let's look and see. hunting is we try to deceive we try to deceive the animal and we do that for one reason to bring them in so we can kill them that's just the facts Satan does the exact same thing to you tonight so he's trying to take every one of you and me out 
That's, that's what he's trying to do. Where did deception, where did it all begin? Well, if you've read the Bible, some of the Bible, it started in Genesis. And, uh, of course, God is the creator. He created everything. The heavens and the earth. He created all. And also, he created Adam and Eve, the first two humans that ever lived. And everything he created, guess what? It was beautiful. Mercy, would you like to have been there? It was unbelievable. He created it for them. It was for them to enjoy. He told them, he said, you can enjoy it all. You're free to eat from any tree in this garden. You're free to eat from any tree except that one over there in the middle. If you eat that one, you're going to die. And so Satan, the first deceiver, comes in. He approaches Eve. And he, he's always done this. He even does it today. He'll take a little bit of truth and he mixes a little bit of lie with it. It's in Genesis 3 if you want to read it, but it went something like this. Eve, did God really say that you couldn't eat that? I think you heard him wrong. Did God really say that you could not eat of that tree? Why would God try to restrict you from being happy? Why does he want to keep good things from you? If he loves you, if God is love, and he loves you, he would not try to restrict things that you want. You know what I think, Eve? Here's what I think. You know what? He knows if you eat it, you'll, you'll be just like him. And he don't want that. Eve, eat it. You will not die. And guess what she did? She ate it. Then she turned around and gave Adam some. Guess what happened that day? They died. They died. Spiritually dead. Separated from God. The connection gone. And they began to run and hide from that point on. Satan uses that same strategy today. He tries to deceive us. Even things that look good to us. I mean the tree that she ate from. It said it was pleasing to the eye and good to eat. He comes at us dangling what we call good things in front of us. Why? To deceive us so he can what? Kill us. That's his strategy. And they died that day. Everybody ever born from that day forward, listen, other than Jesus, is in Adam. You know what that means? You're dead in sin. You are in the same condition that Adam and Eve are in. You are born dead in sin, separated from God, just like they were. And when we stand before Him, tonight, in just a few seconds, I'm going to share the gospel with you. But let me tell you something, folks. Even if you didn't hear it tonight, there's nobody in this room that will stand before God and can give any excuse. The Bible says... That, well, first of all, in Romans 3, it says we're all sinners, we're all worthless. No one does good, not even one. The Bible says in Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Every one of us. We're born in sin, we're sinned by nature, we're sinned by choice. And the wages of breaking God's law, guess what that is? It's death. The wages of breaking his law is death. And if God is good, and he is, he's also holy. What does that mean? He has to, by his very nature, punish sinners. He has to. If he did not, he would not be a good God. The Bible also says... In Deuteronomy, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. So we're all sinners. We're all in Adam at one point. We're going to die if something don't happen. Somebody has to die. 
But just in a second, I want to tell you some good news. But first, nobody's without excuse. Romans 1.20 says, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made. Check it out. So that people are without excuse. You will not stand before God with an excuse. Psalm 19 says, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of His hands. You know, sometimes when I go deer hunting, I get out there real early in the morning. Man, it's awesome. Whew. You know, and I, after I leave about 10, I might call my wife. She said, how'd you do? I said, did great. Did you get you a big buck? No, that's not good. I said, you should have been there. You said, and you get in that stand real early in the morning, you know, and you look up in millions of stars. Oh, it's unreal. The heavens declare the glory of God. It's unreal. And then a few minutes later, you hear a bird. You see the sun coming through the through the trees, and you hear one bird. And then three minutes later, the whole forest is singing. An orchestra of life. Y'all, we serve a big, big, big God. Don't we? I was on the internet this week. Check this out, y'all. Isn't that beautiful? Is our God not big? Did you know this? Y'all, can y'all see this? Did y'all know this? This is the planet Earth. <laughs> it is spinning a thousand miles an hour. Does it feel like we're going a thousand miles an hour? And not really, does it? But it's spinning a thousand miles an hour. And guess what? It's going around the sun at 65,000 miles an hour. Isn't that crazy? If this Earth was tilted one degree off its axis, guess what? We wouldn't be here tonight. We serve a big God. This ain't no little God. Our God is huge. Look at that. And if you go out, just a, a mere 93 million miles, look what he put in the sky for us. 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit on the surface. 865,000 miles across. Every second, it's like a billion nuclear bombs going off. That's how powerful that is. It warms us. It sends light to us. 186,000 miles every second. Takes light about, I think, eight minutes to get here. We serve an unbelievable... He put that up there for us. Do we not serve a big God? Unbelievable. A few more pictures as I was scoping. You can't measure. You know, we went. This is 93 million miles. That's nothing. When you measure, uh, when you measure in the universe, you don't do a yardstick. You don't do miles. You use light years, right? 186,000 miles in a second. How far would that light go in a year? That's how we measure the universes. This is this is our uh, this is where we live. This is our subdivision. This is the uh, Milky Way galaxy, 100,000 100, light years across. You know, we think we're the center of the universe, don't we, in the Earth. It all revolves around us. You know where we are right here? Let's come over here. I might have to put my glasses on. Let's see. Hmm. Where are we at? We, surely we're here. Now, nah. look at that little bitty dot right there. That's our solar system. The sun's in there, all the planets, the earth. And there are trillions and trillion, trillions of these scattered across the universe that we know of. Is our God not big? Is he not? It's amazing. Check this out. It's beautiful. Oh, isn't that pretty? This is 8,000 light years out. This is the, uh, I think it's called the hourglass... Nubula? Is that how you pronounce it? Any science teachers here? Just like an eyeball in the middle, but that's a dying star emitting gases off right there. 8,000 light years out. 
Check this one out. I'm getting close, y'all. Boy, this is pretty right here. Let me see what this one is. This is the uh, Sombrero Galaxy. 28 million light years. 28 million light years. It is uh, 50,000 light years wide, trillions of miles thick. What is it doing? Glorifying God. Do we not serve a big God? This is not unbelievable. Last picture, maybe. This is pretty right here. That's called the, uh, the Whirlpool Galaxies. 31 million light years away. They call that the darling of astronomy. Made up of hundreds of billions of stars. These little pink spots are, are stars being birthed every second. Humongous. Last picture. When I saw this next picture, I'm going, these are stout. These are stout. I mean, I was in awe. My mind was blown away. This right here, 31 million. We, we do this because of technology. The, Hub, the Hubble telescope has given us the ability to do this. But we're pushing the limit right now. This next, next one just blew my mind. It blew. We serve a big God. Colossians 1.16 For in Him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through Him for Him. It ain't about us, y'all. He made the very cross that He hangs on. Philippians 2, 6 through 8. Who being in the very nature of God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by making the very nature, by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in a human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. 27 years ago, Jesus took my place. I'm the guilty one. I deserve to die. He's done nothing wrong. God came to earth. I know it sounds, for those who don't believe, it sounds kind of far out there. The invisible God wrapped himself in flesh. Remember what I said? Something had to die. It had to be perfect. Jesus came, wrapped himself in flesh, born of a virgin, lived for 33 years, and at the appointed time went to the cross, died on the cross as payment for sin. A final payment, paid in full. Put him in a tomb, three days later, he rose from the grave, conquering death. And if you are in him, you see when we're born, we're in Adam. The only way to get in him is by birth. You have to be born again. Shane, come up here. And I want to say this, and I'm closed. There's a lot, there's a lot of men and women and children, but I just feel compelled to say one thing to men. You know, we think we're we can handle it, don't we? We're a lot of good men here. And a lot of times pride keep us from coming to God. Why? Because if we if we say that we can't do anything, then that makes us almost seem like we're weak as a man. Guess what? You can't do nothing. Your works are like filthy rags. The Bible says you must be born again. And when you're in Christ, you have eternal life. It's real. It's real.